we would like to acknowledge the land on which we gather is the occupied territory of the Iowa, Sakan Meskwaki, Wapatan, and Sioux people. When I began the Tuna Speedway uh, project, <clears throat> this basically was a uh, uh, stock car track in our in our hometown that <clears throat> operated for 35 years. Um, for whatever reason, um, I always was curious how it was that it came about um, when I started to see if I could find information at whether it was the library or the museum. Um, virtually no one had any information. So that's what got me going on uh, researching the uh, the history of that particular track. And that got me into gathering photos and and trying to identify, and, you know, all those things together kind of uh, worked into uh, how I got involved in this. Um, I think we'd all agree that <clears throat> the automobile has uh played a pretty big part in all of our lives for you know now it's 110 years that the that the automobile has actually been around um so we see a lot of images obviously um that include automobiles and in and in some cases that's actually maybe the only clue that you have about what the date might be of that particular image um you can look at things like fashion and 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 maybe some surrounding signage or whatever it might be um but the vehicle may be the only thing that you have that you can actually go and take a look at and see if you can at least get an idea of what that uh of, of what the uh age of that particular uh image is the image that you have up front right now is uh obviously a lady uh standing next to a a, a car in this case um uh, the vehicle's name is actually on the front of the car, but that isn't always the case. And I'll show you some examples of things uh, that will help you to at least identify what that vehicle might be, what its age might be. Um, and that may then bring you toward uh, getting some sort of date um, set uh, for that particular, uh, that particular image. But in this particular case, um, you've got a, a First off, it's a color image, and color photography didn't really uh, become very common until the 1950s. Um, and so people actually started carrying uh, cameras around and taking their own pictures, and they would have them processed in color. So that makes a difference in, in this particular case. Um, lady's wearing white gloves. She's got an ornate hat on. Uh, so that kind of gives you at least a general idea of, of what era this might be in. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's kind of the start of what this, what this might be. When you look at vehicles, um, and particularly when you get into the, the 1950s, and I'll, I'll cover some of this, um, there's a lot of things that were done on those vehicles in particular, uh, that had not happened before that time in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, whatever it might be. After the war, um, the, the car manufacturers uh, made a real effort to begin to style vehicles more. And a lot of that styling, it was in, in some cases pretty subtle. In this particular case, with this photo, this particular car, um, I took a look at uh, not only, I know that it's a Chevrolet, but what year Chevrolet is it? Um, the, the car companies would put things on like the hood ornament that's up above. Um, the turn signal lights might change position. And I'll show you a couple of things where uh, cars that look very much alike are actually different, but you have to be, you have to look at further subtle changes. Okay, <clears throat> so this is 1950 um, and Remember when we looked at that last photo, um, the hood ornament up up on up on the front of the hood is it's a different shape. It doesn't look the same, even though the cars, if you had them sitting side by side, would look very much like uh, the turn signal uh, lenses are in a different position. 
Um, but a lot of the rest of the car looks pretty much like the one that we just looked at. And uh, so that's, this is just as the uh, car manufacturers were beginning to change and uh, more stylized into more stylized vehicles. And pretty much all the manufacturers did exactly the same thing. Um, I'm just happening to be using a Chevrolet as a, as an example. So in 51, um, again, you look at the front of that vehicle, the hood ornament has changed. It still has that Chevrolet script on the, on the, uh, the front of the grill, and it has the, uh, more stylized, um, turn signals, everything else on that vehicle, if you put them side by side, basically look exactly the same. So they're kind of hard to, to uh, uh, pull, uh, make them look <laughs> very different. And that was done intentionally because the car manufacturers at that time were recovering from uh, the war effort. They were trying to uh, build their, uh, their car lines back up again. And so they were uh, they were doing very minor things to make changes and uh, to get so that they could actually begin to uh, be serious about their uh, their designs. Hey, this is fifty two. Again, looks very similar. Uh, the the uh, grill has changed a little bit. They've taken the name off the grill itself, that bar up at the top of the grill, and they placed it on the hood with a little hood ornament. Um, the uh, turn signal lights look similar, but they're not the same. And the other thing about the 52 is that they went to a, a row of teeth, basically, inside that grill. Um, and that that became something that they used for uh, a few years uh, going forward. This is 1953. Oh, completely different. Um, they've They've not only changed the, the hood ornament, but they've changed the entire grill. Uh, the bumpers, if you uh, looked at them side by side, you'd see that they're very different. The headlights are different. The they, They've gotten a lot fancier in uh, the use of chrome and um, we're, we're right on the, uh, the lead edge of the uh, fabulous 50s when uh, car design really became very more, a lot more exotic, a lot different colors, lots of chrome, uh, lots of things that were happening during that time. And uh, this was just on the edge of that. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the 50s um, are probably a little easier to deal with because um, the changes were more dramatic as you got into the mid 50s. Uh, and obviously into the 60s, 70s, even up into the 80s. Um, but before that time, and this is where a lot of these really early cars are difficult to uh, find any distinction. Um, in a lot of cases, you had to look for very specific things. In, in this particular case, um, the headlight. Um, these were actually... Uh, this was a kerosene headlight. Um, they had a, um, the auto manufacturers at that time, and there were actually hundreds of them, um, would actually buy components from various companies. And a lot of times they'd be buying uh, uh, headlight units, for instance, from a very specific company. And then they'd put those on their car. Now that same headlight might show up on another car also, but at least it gave it gives us some idea of when that particular headlight uh, was in use, uh, who it was that manufactured it, and who they sold it to. So there were a number of things that you could do with that. Um, the other thing is the wheels. Um, up until uh, close to the 1920s, um, most cars used wood spoked wheels. This is actually a, a 1960s Packard. It's about uh, 61 or 62. And this is, I placed this one in there primarily because these cars don't exist anymore. Um, but at one time, they were one, one of the most uh, elegant and, and probably um, uh, most sought after vehicles that were on the road. In this particular case, this model Packard was called a Clipper. And everybody knew what a clipper was. So 
but it was only used for a very short period of time. And so you could actually date the vehicle by looking at what kind of markings did it have on it. The other thing that was uh, interesting about Packard is it used a, an emblem that looked like a, uh, the, 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 the steering for a ship. Um, and obviously the, the word clipper and, and shipper you know, go together. But that's what they used and that helped to distinguish that particular car during that short period of time that it actually was uh, being manufactured. Or a lot of manufacturers started using uh, either model emblems or logos, um, and they would use those on over uh, a continuous number of years. In this particular case, this is a, a logo from a Chevy. Um, it's a if you if you can see what it is, it's basically a an Impala uh, uh, that's. Uh, placed over the top of a of a couple of cross racing flags. Now they used this this particular emblem for quite a number of years to uh, distinguish their Impala Chevrolet Impala models. Um, so it became a it was something that was very recognizable. People knew what it was ex immediately. And so that emblem became very important to uh, identifying that particular, uh, vehicle. This is a 1960 Chevrolet Impala, by the way. So we got into the, as you got into the 50s, and uh, we started seeing a lot more uh, stylized design, those kind of things can be used to give us at least a general idea of where, you know, when these cars were actually built and what the date might be. In this case, this is a 1950 uh, Oldsmobile. And Oldsmobile was very, uh, uh, actually, uh, they were, they, they were pretty aggressive in trying to uh, beat out uh, any of the other vehicles that were being built at that time that, that they competed with. So they came up with a number of emblems. Uh, the one on the, on the very right or on the left is uh, actually, it's hard to see in this one, but it's, it's a uh, it looks like a rocket ship with a with a the the uh, numbers eighty eight, and they used that rocket eighty eight as a uh, that was a marketing uh, uh, slogan that they used that, that that these cars had the rocket eighty eight engine, which obviously would make it run like a rocket. Um, they also used uh, they made a real uh, uh, effort to. Uh, include their Oldsmobile uh, logo. At that time, it was a, a globe uh, that was surrounded by uh, this uh, kind of a chromed uh, handle, and you can see that in the middle. And then on the on the side, the and this this was pretty well uh, uh, ran across pretty much all of the car companies was the uh, taillights. Uh, in this case, they're a finned, chromed, very fancy taillight. Um, this isn't even a very fancy, uh, necessarily expensive car, um, but that's what they used to distinguish them uh, from all the other vehicles that were out there. Um, if you can find those particular things, in a lot of cases, you'll find, uh, particularly online, uh, people that either collect those kind of, you know, just the taillights or the emblems or those trunk handles or whatever it might be. And obviously, they're going to know what the what the uh, dates are for those. Uh, and like I said, in, in this case, it's a uh, it's a 1950 vehicle. This is just another example of. Uh, in this case, it's a 1955, and it's a Buick. Um, and but they had some very specific styling cues that they used. Um, they used a very fancy taillight uh, uh, unit that was chrome and and had a lot of uh, detail and just a lot of things that uh, made that particular uh, taillight stand out. People knew what that was when they saw it. Same thing with the handle on the uh, trunk lid. Um, very detailed, uh, kind of exotic looking, uh, had a logo that was that that sat right in the center of it. Um, just looked just looked rich. Um, another thing about the Buicks, and this this one's a little bit hard to see, uh, but even today, on the uh, upper right, uh, you'll see a circle 
And what I've circled is, uh, they're called ports. Um, and Buicks, even today, if you look at a Buick, you'll see that there's these little, uh, these little emblem things that they sit on the side of the fender. And those ports are what were, uh, at that time, kind of a fake exhaust port. Uh, the very earliest uh, vehicles that Buick built actually had exhaust uh, that came out the side of the fender. Um, well, they carried that on and they continue to use that as uh, something that kind of uh, distinguishes the Buick from everything else. The other thing that I wanted to point out is that <clears throat> during the 1950s, particularly the early 50s, um, a lot of uh, cars were using wide white walls. And that's that's what that uh, arrow is down at the, in the lower right. Um, it didn't last for a real long time, only about four years. Um, now, that doesn't mean that white walls went away. They didn't, but they became narrower. And um, so that this kind of places that particular car in an era when uh, wide white wall tires were kind of the rage and, and part of the styling. Um, one other area, and this is this gets back into the uh, early 30s. Um, a lot of uh, vehicles and manufacturers who started using mascots um, or these uh, rather exotic looking uh, hood ornaments. And so in some, in some cases, uh, images, if you can see that there's a, uh, some kind of a hood ornament up there, that'll probably give you a really good idea of exactly what that car is. In this case, this is a Packard. Um, that is the goddess of speed. And so that immediately uh, gets you into about a three or four year uh, time frame that that particular vehicle was, uh, was being used. And I'll do it. 